what I'm going to show you now is the same presentation I had the privilege to give in Davos, in the World Economic Forum, in January. Uh, and I, I got a very, I was almost as nervous as I am today, because there I, I got the task to lecture to the specialists who are coming to lecture at Davos. And here I'm going to lecture about demographic and, and, uh, and child uh, data for those who produce it and compile it. Now, what did I do here? What did I do uh, in this? Uh, Gapminder Foundation, we have had the privilege to collaborate with many of us, and our idea is to focus on the data where there is ignorance. Many of the data people are known, it's fine, it works. We are taken to our task to say, how can we get along with that data which is not understood? And, and we want to do that by seeing how you could create and, and produce a fact-based worldview. We must have data on if people understand data. We have to measure impact. Huh? So we started what we call our ignorance project. We started to measure what do the public and different professional groups actually know about the world. The consumers of our data, how are they doing? Huh? So I was thinking I should do that with you also here. Huh? How many of the world's one-year-old children got measles? It's very, very I interesting now when, when, when it's an issue, even in the richest countries. Huh? And one-year-old means before your second birthday, huh? that, that target year. Is it 20%, 50%, or 80% of the children across the world who get measles vaccine? Measles then being that established best vaccine. Now we have the pneumococcal, we have other vaccine coming now, but this is the one which we have been been pushing and promoting. Uh, a, B, or C, press hard. And I get, yes, you should be quick in answering here. Uh, and you are there, thank you very much. There, I stop this and we go on. Now, where do people live in the world? Do the seven billion live like that up there? Is there one billion in Europe, two billion in America, one in Africa, and three in Asia, or is it one, 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 four, or is it one, one, two, three? A, B, or C? Now, when I was born, there were less than one billion people in the world. 800 million, uh, people, sorry, children, zero to 15, zero to 15 here. Then it increased to two billion, and, and, uh, and uh, UN Population Division has given us a mid-estimate uh, which is one of these three. The other three I made up just to make a quiz. <laughs> so do the experts across the street say that the number of children will not increase or be in this range? Do they say it will be three billion or four billion? Will it continue the same? What will the number of children be by, by the end or the second part of this century? Now, this is a little wrong in this one. It should say 25-year-old men. 25-year-old men in the world have on average been around eight years to school. This data is, uh, there are different sources and, and, and it's not so really clear, this number. But we take three very different alternatives for women. It's about the gender gap in access to school now. Have women 25 years and older, disregard the 30 there, have they been three, five, or seven years to school? And now money. Extreme poverty, less than $125, or however you would like to explain it. Has it almost doubled the last 20 years, the proportion in poverty? Has it remained more or less the same, or has it almost halved? There's an uncertainty range to this one, but this is qu quite clear which one of this is the correct one, listening to different sorts of experts. They would agree on this one. Eh? <laughs> this is what the Swedes said. What we have done is that we take web survey companies, and they're quite good these days to formulate web questions and get answers, and they measure microseconds, so you can see that people don't fiddle around with smartphones and get this uh, answer, that they get them correctly. And the proof, that, the proof that this is quite good is that when you take our neighboring country, you get almost the same result. So you have one company in Sweden, one in Norway, you, you study the same population, and you should get more or less the same result there. And then we have done it in the US, we have done it in some more countries. That's a little different like this. The interesting thing is that this is the right answer. And not even in this building. 
We have 83% of the children in the world that gets this life-saving vaccine. Thank you very much, UNICEF, for supporting. Not doing, but for supporting. <laughs> it is exactly the same frequency as in Marine County in San Francisco, where the ignorance of measles vaccination is breeding. And it's interesting, you know, it's much better. And it's 8% in Sweden, 10 and 17. It's very strange. <laughs> I say people are not entitled to discuss development aid if they don't know this. The impression the population have in these countries who happen to be countries whose taxpayers are really supporting. And when you ask the experts in Davos, you get 28% to know the right answer. And when you ask the audience who come to listen to Bill and Melinda Gates in the big hall in Davos, you don't get hired. MDG failed to inform the public. I worked hard for that. You worked hard for that. Sometimes one had to see fair. It didn't fail to improve the situation for people, but it failed to tell the people that situation has improved. This is the strange thing. So this using data is much more complex than we thought. I got embarrassed from this. You know? It's much more easy to become famous than to have impact. That's my conclusion. <laughs> so in people, which one was this? This is how you said, eh? this is the right one. Eh? And this is the Swedes, this is the Norwegians, this is America. Eh? And here, wow. This is the right answer. The number of children in the world have stopped increasing. It will, of course, be a little more, and, and you have an uncertainty range which is relatively wide. But more or less, it's not increasing any longer. And, and in, 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 this, in this situation here, we have 33% we have of you think that it will continue like this. 39% thinks this and 17% thinks this. Now, well, you're in good company. <laughs> but you see, I have one group which beats you all. I went to the zoo and asked the shimps, and 33% <laughs> got it right. It's interesting, you know, if you do this by random, if I wouldn't have shown you the question, I would have asked you, which do you think is right, A, B, or C? It would be 33% of each one. So on this question, you, as well as all the ones we have studied, every group we have studied, score worse than random. Score worse than random. If you score worse than random, the problem is not ignorance. The problem is not a blank mind. The problem is something, the head is filled with something that is wrong. It's only preconceived ideas that can make a group score worse than random. And this is our problem to show the progress of the world because there is an idea in the mind that this won't happen. There's an idea in the world that Africa will not lower child mortality. That people in Asia with other religions that they will not plan their families in a way so they can give a good, good life for their children. There's such a strong idea, and some people even still talk about this ugly word, population explosion. I want to forbid that term. We do that with our students, unethical. It's telling that other people's loved children are terrorist bombs, which threatens you. That's the origin of this term. It should be abolished. We should stop doing it. We should look at the number and see what is happening, you know. And look here, look here. Education. Yeah. This is the right answer. I heard, I heard what you said. You said that there are 60 million children who do not go to primary school. That's appalling, unacceptable. And you said that most of them are girls, and that's correct. But you didn't say that it's only 55% who are girls. The big news is not that most of them are girls. The big news is that there is almost no gender inequality in primary school any longer in the world. It's gone. It's over. We don't use data when we see that one expression give us money. 
And what does it mean that we don't send out the big message? The girls did it. Not easily, but by fighting, by demanding. Their mothers did it. Their aunts did it. The women organization did it. Wise fathers contributed. Great organization like UNICEF supported it. We did it. No, we say, oh, girls don't do it. Most of them are not girls. We don't celebrate this. I was in the World Bank when Kim asked Malala, the first time she, she visited the World Bank, he asked, why doesn't girls go to primary school? And she answered, the reason why girls and boys don't go to primary school is mainly that they live in extreme poverty and have to work to feed the family. And then she took a deep breath. But there are also still some communities where there's cultural obstacles to girls to go to school. She got it right. But most people don't listen to Malala. They refer to her as an object. She's extremely knowledgeable. She gets everything right. I've listened to Emma several times what she says, and she gets it right. Girls and women across the world have made an enormous progress in getting into primary school. Does this mean that gender, gender issues is over? Not at all. There's brutal gender problems in the world for girls and young women, but it has moved from 7 to 14. And there it is even worse today when they've gone to school, because today young girls know their ability. They know how hard they have studied. And many places they study much harder than the boys. And they do better in school, and they have ideas about their li lives, and then they are stopped. So we need to strengthen our work for gender equity. But we have to get it right. We have to use the data and say, we did this with primary school. That is far from enough. Now we move to the next step. And as you said, sexual assault, all these terrible things that young women you know, and girls in their teens are exposed to. But we have to use the data, and we just don't do it. We stick to this image that girls and women are incapable of even getting to primary school, and that's wrong. Uh, so we have, to, we have to advance with it. Uh, and money then, yeah. Here you got it. This you got. It has. So you know more about money than about girls. <laughs> How come? Now we can't even use quantitative methods. We must do qualitative methods. What is it to make a group like this know more about money than about girls? Is it because those who are fighting for this, they are proudly celebrating their victories, whereas we who work with the social sides, we are not celebrating our victories. Because we stick to the impression that girl, uh, children are not vaccinated, girls don't go to school. Because it's what our, our organization, is. I don't know, I'm just speculating. now. Why is it like this? It's, 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 quite, it's quite interesting how, how it could be like this. So what we have found out is that we have to do a step where we don't need big data. We need basic data. We must have some sort of data right on which we then can put the detailed data. Because detailed data is indeed needed, as you rightly said, quintile data, inequities that has been missed. But we, we seem to lack the overall picture of what is happening in the world. So if we divide the world like this, and being gap-minded, we are allowed to decide what is Europe. And to give Europe a chance, we decided that Greenland is there, and Turkey is there, and the whole of Russia. Eh? <laughs> In the United Nations, you have to be diplomatic. We have no, no, no intention of, of uh, provoking him. We made Australia or Asian. Eh? <laughs> they have to get used to it. You know? if, you look at, if you look at trade data, you can see where Australia belongs these days. There's no question about that. It's an Asian country. Eh? And, 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 and um, we are, uh, as the population division tells us, we are 7 billion people. Uh, and one live in America, one in Europe, one in Africa, and four in Asia. Pin code 1114. <laughs> it's basic things like this we have to have. We have to get the idea where are the people. Uh, and, and, and if we look at 2050, and I, I take the overall, the, the distant view on, on the world population prospects. I see that there will be no more in Europe and America, but there will be one billion more there, and there will be one billion. Yes, there will be 100 million retired people in Latin America, but that's not so interesting. Huh? 
and there is not fully one billion in Europe because Europe is decreasing and immigration is not enough to keep up for it. Longer life is not enough, so there is place in Europe. Uh, and, 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 and with this, 2050, it seems as fast growth will be over in Asia. It may continue to grow slowly. There's a lot of obsession whether it grows or doesn't grow. The important is the, the speed of growth. And Africa seems to double, more or less. And by the end of the century, no more in America, Europe, or Asia, but one or most probably two billion more in Africa. So there will be four billion in Africa. And when I show this, I, I lecture at the financial sector, corporate sector, highest level and political levels, NGOs, universities across the world, and people say, this is impossible. This won't happen. We can't have four billion in Africa. Exactly what I heard when I was in primary school and when UN population did their, their estimate for Asia and said there will be, be 1.3 billion in India. Oh, that will never happen. That is stupid. You can go back and read what the newspaper said in Europe and North America at that time. You know? These demographers, we waste money on them. And it was almost completely right. I think it was 4% wrong. The prediction from 1958 was 4% wrong for 42 years. And I go around the world and challenge everyone in economics and in medicine. Have they ever done a 42-year prediction, which is 4% wrong? We know this demography, more or less. You know, It seems to be relevant. And the problem seems to be this, that if I split this into a concept which you could call the Old West, North America and West Europe. Uh, that is 10% of the population, and this will be more than 80. Atlantic will be backwaters. <coughs> this will be the main human trait. If you have money, buy real estate on the East African coast, especially beachfront property in Somalia, I strongly recommend. <laughs> and I always get a laugh. Though we see all these problems in the Middle East, you go there, you come to Ramallah, you see the enormous human skin. You see a completely different picture also than what we can see of the tragedies, which are true tragedies and which should be communicated, but there's another thing going on also. Florida, you know, <laughs> can't buy beachfront properties, too costly, don't even think about it. Huh? Key West, why was Key West built? To fight the pirates. Very interesting, historically, why Key West was built. To open for trade from the Mississippi here. Doing. And Somalia is now getting piracy, is now getting down, getting down. This is the time. This is the time. And you can see all the people here want to go to the beach. There are beautiful beaches in Somalia. There's, that we get, I think we get images of different parts of the world. We miss the progress. We miss to see the potentials. It is as if when we look at data, we don't see the big trend going on in the world. That girls go to school now. Children are vaccinated. Yes, indeed, we have extreme poverty. We have more work to be, to be done in that. Yes, indeed, we must have sustainability. But the whole world is changing. There's a convergence in the world now, which we haven't seen before. Uh, and, 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 and this is behind it. One of the most important things is fertility rates. We show it like this. In Europe, it went down here. From six, 1800, six children per woman, 1842, almost 80% of my relatives on my mother's side moved over to Minnesota and then onward to Oregon. And it came down like this, and now Europe can't sustain its own population. Then America came down like this, population boom after the war, and down to two. This is all of the Americas. Yeah. Catholic Brazil today, 1.8 children per woman, less than Sweden. Sweden now has almost 2.0 in fertility rate. So I tell my friends who are uh, in concerned about the environment in the same way as I am. But they say we have to stop population growth. Yeah, better start in Sweden, I say. <laughs> it's the only place where fertility rates is climbing now. Or there are some other countries in West Europe. So why don't start in those countries where it's climbing? Huh? And we have to take away day, uh, daycare subsidies in Sweden and the child allowances and so on, and we can get down fertility rates in Sweden. It's very strange, this coupling of population <coughs> to environment. I don't see any reason for doing that. Huh? Asia, population bombs had poor air relish, and then this happened. It's done. 
500 million people in India live in nine states that are two children per woman or less average in India, 2.6. And that get data seems to be reasonably good. Of course there are inequities. Of course there are inequities. But the inequities goes two way in India. One is extremely poor area with still four or five infertility rate if you go into small group. The other is highly educated women in, uh, in India now with one child, a fertility rate of one. Uh, this low fertility rate we see in, in Asia, most probably due to lack of gender equity uh, among the most developed. And Africa, is it changing? Yes, it is. It's going down like this. And this is why we eagerly will follow the coming population prospects and see how this change will come. Perhaps the most interesting is where will we end up here in the future? Is there a normal? Is too normal? What is it? Uh, that, that's, that's very difficult to know. But this is what we see to get it. The children is not increasing, it's adults that is increasing. I call it peak child. Uh, and we try to simplify to the border of what you can be allowed, world population prospects. No other calculation, just trying to make it simple. We haven't really satisfied. We think we will wait to the 2015 and see how it comes out. But if each doll here is 100 million, in this, in, in this here are the Europeans, 15 years, 30, 45, 60, and above. So this is me, 60 years and older in Europe. Well, I'm one of the 100 million, so. <coughs> America almost the same. In Africa, already today, more children below 15 in Africa than you can find in the entire America and Europe together. Starting in Argentina, all the way up to Canada, turn right, all the way through Europe, including Turkey and Russia, <coughs> we have more children here. And the reason why this people is not here in the older age group is not mainly because they have died, it's that they were never born. There were less people born in the past. So <coughs> even if you make the theoretical assumption that magic happens tonight and we get child mortality down in Africa tonight, we get 75 year life expectancy, we have a fertility rate of two as of tomorrow, Africa's population will still double. There's no way, there's no way you can avoid. Huh? And we know that it won't go that fast, you saw the blow line, so there will be more, more people in Africa. So my strong advice to Europeans is to start to be polite to Africans already today. Because you will be outnumbered. <laughs> you will out It doesn't matter whether you will be enemies or whether you will be friends, then they will be your customers and your tourists. Just start being polite. <laughs> it's a very clear take home message here, you know? <laughs> and in <laughs> Yeah, it's time. Time is coming. Huh? <laughs> Use the numbers, I say. Use the numbers. See what's happening. Asia. No more uh, ha happening yet. Why will the population grow? One of the worst examples of ignorance we see is these males from secondary school children in Sweden, in West Europe, in America. Bill and Melinda tells me that the most common male they get, well, if you save the poor children, you destroy the planet. Why don't you think more about the environment? We even had a very ugly little group in one of the Nordic countries that tried to stop support to UNICEF because it would destroy the planet. This concept that still exists, that it's the ch death of children that keep control for population, is wrong. There's no moral problem with that statement. It's just wrong. <coughs> because the reason why this will grow is not that the number of children will increase. Look what will happen. Does UNICEF know what happens to people like me? Are you aware of that age range? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, someone from the mortality group in the <laughs> to a population. Well, sorry, the news today, people like me, they die. Eh? Sooner or later, often sooner than later, they die. So here they go, they're gone. Eh? The rest of you shouldn't laugh, you get older, ha <laughs> ha. And you have children, that's the wonderful news. Eh? You have children. They all die, the rest grow older, and you have children. The rest, they all die, the rest grow older, and you have children. They all die, the rest grow older, and you have children, and we are in 2085. Number of children have not increased, but look what dramatic difference we will have in the world. 
and I've seen special analysis of that, that we really have an increase of children in Africa and we have a decrease in Asia and also in Europe. If we would make this much more detailed data is available on this. Uh, and we will see a shift on where the children live. And the challenge with this is that children as a group will not increase, but children are moving towards poverty. Children as a virtual group, they are children who become 15 or replaced by a newborn child which lives under lower economic condition than the one we have. That's why focus on children is so important in the coming decades. Because where children are, there will be more and more children will be in, in the poorest part of Sub-Saharan Africa. Because in some part, the prosperous part of, of uh, population in Africa, there the fertility rate will fall which we already have. Addis Ababa is 1.6 children per woman today. Less than Stockholm, less than New York. Yeah. So, <coughs> so this is the fill up of adults. 2.5 billion more or less. Very difficult to see how you could avoid that if you are not going to kill people. No, yeah, it's ugly what I say, but this is what I hear on almost daily or weekly basis, people who are environmental concern and say, we must not be more people in this world, we must stop it now at seven. It can't be done. And this is even taught in schools, and I'm talking about my country, I'm talking about my failure in my country to get this through. You will take care of your own countries. But it's so difficult, it's something. I think it's in the richest countries, it's a toxic combination of arrogance and ignorance that makes it unconceivable that we will have almost the entire mankind will be Asian and Africans. That this America and this Europe is, is a margin out here. It's a margin out here. And I think this is a, re a, tr a true concern when we work now, because we will have children living under so many different conditions. Yes, some will live longer here. Many are very excited. Of course, I want to be this one. Because then I can follow statistics for 15 more years, you know. Uh, <laughs> and be you know, extreme poverty will decide how many people there will be here. Gender equity will decide how many children women in Asia will have. Perhaps this is the most difficult to foresee. Huh? And, and uh, this is what our students say. If you save the poor children, you destroy the planet. We really have to get an end to this. We really have to get an end to this concept that that child mortality stops population growth. We have failed with that. It's still out there. Paul Ehrlich still runs the show. All Chinese cannot have a car. It's a very common statement in Sweden. They heard it in China and they acquired the Volvo company and now the Swedes don't say it any longer. <laughs> <coughs> you see, it takes some big moves you know, to have the, the formerly rich people to become it. Toxic combination of ignorance and arrogance. This happens. One part of the world got better, the other remained behind. Eh? This is not improving so fast, the rest is catching up. Let me try to, to finish and show how this, how this looks if I look at child data. Look what I have here. My beloved bubble graph. Each country is a bubble. <laughs> the size of the bubble here today is child death. So, and this is 1964, this is China, this is India. Lot of population, lot of child death, because here you have child mortality, 100, 200, 300. Here is size of families. So there were many children born, there were high child mortality, big bubbles, tragic. 17,000 you said today. I started to teach global health, it was 30,000 we said. We said, so isn't that fantastic? Eh? All the population have been growing, you know. Eh? And, and so, so number of children dying has been halved during my active adult professional time. So what has happened now from 64? Have they, this divided world, this, as they say in Sweden, we and them. Eh? And many say we should help them, but it's a very vague idea who we are and who them are. Has this gone down? There's still the idea, you see, you get that most of these children are not vaccinated, but they are vaccinated. Eh? And they do go to primary school, almost all of them, both boys and girls. So if I run this now, look what has happened. Child mortality has come down, 
and family planning has become available. This is China moving here, here is uh, Brazil coming, this is Mexico, this is Indonesia coming here. Look at Bangladesh, Bangladesh is catching up here, <laughs> catching up here, you know, this is Pakistan. And here comes Ethiopia, here comes Ethiopia moving fast forwards and the countries go down. See how they are shrinking, the bubbles are shrinking. And we are getting less child mortality. This whole mountain up here with high child mortality, big families, lots of tragic child deaths are gone. But we are not over. It's not finished. So much more to do here. Huh? Congo is here, uh, Afghanistan is there, Nigeria is there because Nigeria is divided as many countries are. And, and let me show one country here which I, 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 I intended to show I can take this back and show you size of population instead. If I show size of population, then you see this is where people live. This is where most of the world population is. Average in the world is 2.5. Huh? And, and how, fast th how fast these countries will come down, we don't know really. Huh? But, but, but they are really changing. And um, if I take the country I was going to show you, I, I think I go back here a little and I look at Nepal. How far down has, has Nepal came? <laughs> Nepal has made it all the way down there. Quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. Quite impressive what they've done. And you go back, you go back up there and you say, well, this is where India was. This is where India was. 1970, we take away Nepal. 1972, I studied at St. John's Medical College in southern India. Huh? And, and, and it was there. I look the rest of the world. The rest of the world remains in 1972. And let's see how far India has gone forward. You see, this was Europe. This was America. This was uh, Japan. Has India come close to that or halfway? How far have they come? It's quite impressive. India today is almost in the position where Europe was when I went there as a young student. This was the distance we perceived India had to cover, and they've done it to here. Of course, with great inequity still, because part of India is already here. 10% of, of India is here, another percent is up here. And I can, I can show you the, the, uh, the Nepal bubble, uh, we, we take away that one, that one I will show you later, this is here, this is Nepal. If I split Nepal into quintiles. Highest quintile, middle quintile, lowest quintile, this is like Thailand, this is Indonesia, this is Vienna. Then it becomes understandable. However, one, one, one um, I think it was, yes, Tanzanian Minister of Health said to me, I don't need the quintiles. Quintiles are not so useful because they don't come with a director that I can fire. <laughs> Sometimes we who work more centrally, we get obsessed by these analyses. If you're a manager uh, and you have to, to make use of a system to improve a system, you need information on province, you need information on districts, on communities. And that's why we still have the challenge with child mortality. Uh, I, I, we, we, uh, we meet I think two or three big challenges in the future. First, in the sustainable development goals, the wish for indicators start with what we would like to measure, not what we are measuring or what we can measure. And there is a wish to measure things in deep poverty where we will not be able to measure it. People ask for civil registration. Yes, civil registration is nice. We all want it. But we won't get it in extreme poverty where we have the high child mortality. We will have to, society has to improve first. There's a big risk to, to the best of my assessment that we focus too much of that and we won't reach out in the poorest area. Yeah? This is one. The other, the other is this idea that cell phones and modern technology would help us very much. Mm. We will get a lot of numerators. Big data is, is bags of numerators without denominator. And without a denominator, it's very difficult to assess. It's often, it can be useful. I had the privilege to work within the Ministry of uh, Health in Liberia for three months. 
I was deputy head of epidemiological surveillance. And I had a very good experience working with, with the Liberian scholars. Too few, but a handful who really stood the test and did the important thing. This is the epidemic curve. A number of confirmed cases per day in Liberia of Ebola. Started here in March. There was a gap here when it ended. Reinfected, continued here, increased in July. Margaret Lamuno, the Ebola specialist from Uganda working in WHO, she had a uh, plane ticket booked here in May to go there and assist. And WHO didn't have core budget to pay for the ticket. It's amazing how much money was lost by not having the right epidemiological surveillance in place when it was needed. I, I don't think we should try to gain experience about handling the catastrophe. We should get experience on how to avoid the catastrophe. Because here there was generous support from many different organizations. UNICEF was important. They did their part in social mobilization in a good way. And we were all surprised that it turned around like this. And then it came down, and we saw very early that it wouldn't drop down like this because Ebola stops as it started. It goes like this. Last case in Liberia, 19th of February. Last patient who survived. Those who died have died. Last patient who survived left hospital this morning, 9 o'clock. As of now, no known case of Ebola virus in Liberia. We are going to wait to the 2nd of April. We are now starting to plan for the party. Which software did we use to get this curve? Excel. It's a widely used software. I don't have shares in Microsoft. <laughs> the database collapsed here. That's why it's jumpy there. The new database was not installed. It was very much, it was very interesting. This was, this was very much about these two things. You know, confidence of the people and Excel. That's what you need to stop the ball. The confidence of people, passion and love for the people and respect for the marginalized people on one hand and then just keep the numbers in the other hand. All those cell phones and all those nice things, yes, 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 but nothing can compare <laughs> with, with, with compassion with people and we had it. And the interesting thing, I have to tell you this, this down here, is entirely done by Liberians and African specialists. African unions came with very good specialists. To me, the experience of working in Liberia was seeing the new Africa come. Very capable people in Africa being, being able to do this. And you need capable people who manage data more than technology. You need knowledge. You need people who have experience to handle data, the complexity of it, not too much on a high level decision is the people who know how to handle data which is important to have. And that's why I can see in the, in the sustainable development goal is the risk that the people who have solid knowledge on how to handle data, what sort of data we can get together, when we should have national service, when not national service, those who have to be reinforced. And you have to be more successful, though all those of you who are here, in telling what is possible, what is not possible. Don't just say, oh, we will get more funding, we will get as many indicators. We have to say, no, this indicator won't work, this will not work. And I think I will end here by saying that child mortality will remain by the end of the day and the end of these decades the core indicator. And it will be so not only, and uh, perhaps not even mainly because it's so important in itself, but it's because child mortality catch so many determinants in the society. Infrastructure, eh? education, gender equity, schools, health service, home, economic level. It catches everything on that. That is one reason. The other reason is that child mortality is something that is continuous. It just gets lower and lower and things get better and better and we want it all the way down to zero. We want it down to zero. It means that we can use, it has the universality, which fertility rate doesn't have. We don't want as few children as possible. We just want families to be able to decide themselves, isn't it? We don't want governments to tell people how many they should have. We just want, we, we want them to decide themselves. GDP per capita, well, there's a limit how much money you need. There's a limit. 
is Norway distinctly more happy than Sweden? Yeah, they are because they are nicer people in Norway than the Swedes are. <laughs> <laughs> they have another attitude than we have. It's not just that they have much more money, you know. The, 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 there is a limit how much money. So GDP per capita, as we know, the Human Development Index has shown, that's not useful because it's not continuous like this. Literacy has a problem because it saturates itself. Schooling also saturates itself. Child mortality doesn't do that. Yeah? That is very, very useful. And also it's well defined. Child mortality is well defined. We have some challenging though, and it's, it's stillborn. We fail to, to, to capture stillborn, which is quite important. It's a tragedy and it measures conditions for women during, during pregnancy, which we don't have. That is a challenge we have. But it's relatively limited, can be overcome. So I, I would argue very strongly, because we had child mortality before MDGs, we had it during MDGs, we still have it. That is what we can measure and how it comes down. So get that working, but don't think we will get it through civil registration where it's most needed. We need the surveys and we need to estimate the determinants like vaccination coverage, like health service coverage. So all of you who know this, who know this data, make your voice heard in this discussion. So we get the right indicators and we get the right focus on the resources of what we get. And be a little careful about these modern gadgets and these modern things. It's solid knowledge about statistics and how you collect it that is the most important. Thank you very much.